Yes, people, welcome to the Neutral Corner end of year show. My name is Jamie Bourne and I would like to start off by wishing you all a Merry Christmas. We hope you're all well and keeping safe. Like all our episodes, this will be available on YouTube, Apple and Spotify podcasts, Podbean and Amazon Music. Thanks for your support recently. The numbers have been going up and 2021 is going to be a big year for us. So keep pushing and help us reach our goal of 100 subscribers. Today, we are doing our end of year awards and joining me to help determine the winners of each category. I'm joined by three members of the Neutral Corner team. So let's meet them. Firstly, my podcast podcast co-host, Charlie Griffiths. How are we, Charlie? Yeah, very well, thank you. I had to uh, get rid of the Christmas tree background as it was a lot more of a faff than I let on during during the podcast. Um, I unfortunately don't have a Christmas jumper to wear. I did find some SpongeBob SquarePants trousers that were made of Christmas trees, but I remember not so long ago watching a documentary of a child molester that got caught wearing them. So I decided in the in the sort of Christmas spirit not to bring it along. I have bought a Christmas beer to proceedings though, so Merry Christmas, everyone. Very nice. Thanks for joining us, Charlie. Next up, Scott James. First time you've been on the uh, on the channel for a while. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm all good, mate. Cheers for having me back on. Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you, mate. And uh, lastly, Usman. Good to have you back on as well. How you been? Thank you for having me. I've been good, thank you. Um, been looking forward to it. Um, it's been a good year of boxing, despite the circumstances. And uh, here's to a happier new year for the upcoming year. So, yeah. Very nice. Thanks, mate. And uh, yeah, we were originally supposed to be filming in a studio today, uh, but as uh, the South East is uh, tier four, none of us were able to do it. So we're jumping on Zoom today, but we hope you still enjoy the episode. The format of today's episode, we have eight categories finished off by a general discussion about fights in 2021. And what will happen is each person will make their case for their category winner. And whichever pick gets the most votes will win the award. It isn't just us guys doing it. We've also spoke to the rest of the team who couldn't make the call. They've given their votes as well. And we'll be publishing the awards on our website officially. um, So check them out over the coming days too. Just to mention, our uh, our sort of Christmas calendar is running from Christmas to Christmas. So we know there's some fights on sort of between Christmas and New Year. um, But they'll roll into next year. So just for example, any of the Japanese fights that are coming up, they can be eligible for next year's awards instead. And now just before we get going, we say grab yourself a beverage. Uh, It's going to be a bit of a longer episode, but we want you to join in and and enjoy the episode. We want you to comment down below if you agree with our picks or not. And I just want to say a, a quick cheers to my teammates for all their work this year and to all the listeners at home thank you for joining us and uh, me- merry christmas and a happy new year so we're going to start off with the first category and arguably the biggest category of the year and it's uh fighter of the year and i've sort of randomized the order so everyone gets to have their say first in different categories and first up we've got usman so usman who's your fighter of the year for 2020 and why um i think you guys may or may not agree with me on this pick but i'm going to stick with the female lopez um, plain and simple, I was originally originally meant to go with Roman Gonzalez because uh, he had a good comeback arc as well after the two losses. But um, yeah, to a female Lopez because um, he beat Richard Comey. And to be honest, I wasn't too impressed with the Comey performance simply because I haven't seen much of Richard Comey to be, for me to say, wow, Comey's in fighter. So I thought, okay. And half of me thought it was a lucky punch as well. But when the fight with Lomachenko got announced, and that fight was in the works for a long time, um, every time that fight came up on socials, every time I'd speak about it in circle of friends, I always thought, oh no, Lomachenko, it's an easy night to work for him. Um, easy night to work. Teofimo is too inexperienced, 15, 16 fights, 21, 22, 23, 23 years old now, but at the time he was 21, 22. Um, so yeah, when the fight originally got announced, I thought to myself, you know what, it'll be an easy night to work for Lomachenko. Um, and obviously with, with the pandemic, it was unfortunate that the fight had to be used a few times. Um, going into the fight, again, I thought we'd see, um, I'm sure if people have read the whole preview piece regarding the fight, I actually, you know, I pointed out a lot of flaws I thought Tiafimo showed, you know, how the shoulder roll doesn't work against South Pools and all that. Um, but I'll be honest, on fight night, he really, he, you know, he shut me up for one. Hard thing to do, but he done it. He shut me up. Everyone, um, I was surprised he walked Lomachenko down as well. I did not like to see him walk Lomachenko down, and I thought the body punches were quite effective as well. Um, you know, many people go to the body against Lomachenko, um, so yeah, when I saw it, it was money in the bank, and that performance, uh, there was times he was in a little, little 
I wouldn't say too much trouble. I'm saying a little bit. Um, but every fan has those days where they'll be in a little bit of trouble. So, uh, yeah, because um, of that now, he says he's undisputed. Uh, we agree with it, whether you're not, you can't deny the fact that I think he's the best lightweight out of the bunch. Um, so, yeah, for me, my pick is Teofimo Lopez. And I am hoping to win against some of the big names next year. You know, the talk of uh, Devin Haney for the WBC belt. Uh, then we'll see who actually is um, undisputed. Um, I'd love to see him in, in against someone like Davis. Uh, even Garcia would be a bad matchup for him. Because uh, it's simple, he's beating the best, not just the best, one of the best lightweights on the planet, but I think one of the best fighters in the last 10, 15 years. Um, so yeah, man, props to Tio for that performance. Um, I hope he needs to shine. Very nice. And now we're moving on to Charlie. Do you agree with us, Moon, or have you gone elsewhere? Uh, no, I do agree with Usman. I, I am somewhat of a Tiafimo Lopez fanboy these days um, and sort of happy to admit it. You know, he's the performance against Lomachenko is great. I, you know, there was a lot of talk of if Lopez, um, the, Lopez was going to do this, he would, he would have to knock him out. He'd have to sort of impose being the bigger man and, and he had just had no way of, of beating Lomachenko on points and and he stuck to every promise he gave. You know, he 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 promised a lot, and and he backed it up. And and not many people can can say that they can go to that truly elite level where Lomachenko was and and back back your talk up. You know, and and I think undoubtedly for who he beat in the circumstances he beat in, as as Usman said, you know, the fight being a rearranged so many times, and 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 Lomachenko almost getting quite quite spiteful in that fight week. You know, there, there seemed to be a new version of Lomachenko that was that almost wanted to teach Lopez a lesson. This wasn't a, a Lomachenko that was messing around at all. And I know I know the excuses have come out a little bit now and, and you know, the the injury excuse, which which no one really likes in boxing. I mean, injuries are, are absolutely a thing, but they do get... I mean, David Hay got still gets absolutely slaughtered to this day for the toe against Klitschko. So um, it's always sort of best to keep it to yourself. But, you know, that was a Lomachenko that was, that was coming to, to really, really punish Lopez. And he just, he just never did. And, and, and for me, what summed up everything about Lopez in that, the whole build-up, the whole belief in himself, was that final 12th round, you know, uh, starting the fight on absolute fire, five or six rounds ahead. And then the master starts to claw rounds back and really starts to teach Lopez something in there and needed a big round to really confirm, to really drill home that win because on some people's cards, it was 6-5 going into that last round and, you know, could easily nab a draw and whatever. And, and just the, the, the sort of performance in that final round after losing possibly four or five on the spin, I thought was really impressive. And yeah, for me, undoubtedly, Tiafimo Lopez is, is the fighter of the year. Oh, so that's uh, two for Tio. What about you, Scott? Are you uh, are you making it three? Yes, I am. I wish I had something different to them two, but I am all Lopez. You know, at the young young age, he's twenty two, twenty three, and beating in eyes oh, most people's pound pound number one, and the style he did, he is undoubtedly the part of the year for me. Short and sweet. Very nice. Yeah, so uh, obviously we put the vote out to the rest of the team as well. And Michael, Alexis and Billy also voted for Tiafimo Lopez. And uh, I too am voting for Tiafimo Lopez. So it's a clean sweep for him. I was thinking it's, you know, it's funny this year that um, in the past you've kind of needed two very good wins or two elite wins to win the award. You look at last year, Canelo beating Jacobs and Kovalev. I mean, you look at 2018 when Usyk beat Bradis, Gassiev and Bellew in a year to win it. It's funny how 2020 sort of judged a little bit differently, the kind of two candidates, and we've seen the Ring Magazine winners, is co-winners between Fury and Lopez, you know, the only two guys really this year with elite level type wins. Um, so it's funny how it's been judged this year, because if you do sort of apply the criteria of, you know, two good wins, you know, you start to extend the conversation a little bit. Usman's pick of, of mentioning Roman Gonzalez is someone that I feel like deserves a shout. Um, you know, still fighting against much bigger people, beating unbeaten champions, beating top tens in his division. That's a very good year for him. Um, and also another one, Joe Smith Jr. deserves a mention as well. You know, beating Jesse Hart and Aleda Alvarez. They're two top 10 guys. Alvarez is actually more pushing towards the top five bracket. Um, so beat, to, to beat two top 10s in your division in a year is also very good. But to be honest with you, I don't think 
Lopez can be disputed. Beating Lomachenko, who was one, two or three in people's lists. I think he's uh, rightfully our fighter of the year and that's a clean sweep for him. Next uh, category we're going into is our prospect of the year. And uh, I've got Charlie to come up first on this one. Who are you voting for prospect of the year, mate? Um, I think I think the guy that, for me, that sprung to mind straight away was more more based on um, the kind of the kind of ridiculous stat he's almost got to his name of you know all these first round knockouts of Edgar Belanga and and there's I think there's a lot of there's a lot of prospects and there's a lot of guys coming through who I mean if we had a clean sweep last time I I can see seven different picks this time but for me this guy has sort of come through and is wiping everyone out um, where it's almost become a it's almost become he's playing up to it in a way, you know, playing up to this. Uh, you have to, you have to, um, you have to work really hard to get to the second round to fight me. I mean, to a point of, I've even seen a chat on social media this week of of talking about Canelo. Now, I mean, that should be absolutely miles away, but it just shows just how how um, sort of fast and 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 fast gathering this this hype train of him is. Um, I'm not. 100% sure if he's necessarily going to go on to have the best career out of the other prospects around at this moment but just on the pure and a fact of he's built up this this reputation off of a of clearly unbelievable power and and a, and just a quite ridiculous stat of taking everyone out in the first round he's for me someone who's put his name forward as the prospect of the year where it, uh, rather than maybe being the actual prospect of the year, if that makes sense, it's it's more how he's forced his way into it. Um, and for me, undoubtedly, I've I've sort of finished the year most excited just to see how good he truly is. Yeah, I think he's going to be a popular pick this year, not just in our awards, but in all the awards. Uh, Scott, you're up next, mate. Who did you pick? <laughs> Funny enough, I have the same guy, Ed Valanda. I am written down right here. 16 wins, 16 first round KOs. So the guy's got me excited. I can't wait to see him next. But I have done a UK fight as well. And that's a fight I've always backed, Fabio Wardley. I think, you know, he's a good fighter. He is, you know, had a great win over Simon Valili. You know, I backed him that whole time. I did, you know, I think he's a good fighter. I had a good win last time against Larty. Hopefully next year he fights um, Nathan Gorman for the British title. Yeah, to be fair, you know, in terms of British prospects, you know, he's really come onto the scene this year and, in the fights he's been put in, he's come through him well. So it's a good pick for uh, prospects of the year. But your your official vote there is Belanga. And yeah. uh, Usman, what about you? Who have you come for? Um, I'm going to disagree on this one. Um, my fight is someone who may also, like Charlie said, not be the prospect of the year. Um, and you guys probably heard me bang on about him a lot as well. Um, it's Jaron Boots Ennis. Um, I think... More so, I look at the record of Ennis, it's at the moment 24 now, 23 KOs. Um, for a welterweight, that's a phenomenal record. Uh, and people will look back to their last fight against Van Heerden, which ended in no contest. Um, yeah, it's cool. Okay, it happens in boxing. You get caught, you get a clash of heads. Um, but it's more so the style. Um, if you know me, I've always been big style of uh, the flashy fighters, um, Fighters who mould themselves in the image of fighters like James Tony, Floyd Mayweather, Hopkins. And when I look at Gerald Ennis, I see all three of them in one. So I see he's got a little bit of Hopkins about him, a little bit of James Tony about him. Uh, he can switch here. Um, and the thing about him is he, does, he hits nowhere near as hard as um, Edgar Belanga. But he's got the type of style where he can break you down round by round, round by round, and he'll leave you in deep water. Um, again, for me, it's simply purely based on the style, um, Jaron Ennis. I was also going to go with Lorenzo Simpson, but I feel like not many people know much about Lorenzo Simpson. And the fact he's only had nine fights against um, journeymen with losing records. Um, but again, also, he is someone who's also built in a similar fashion to, sorry, uh, Jaron Ennis is also someone who's built in a similar fashion to Lorenzo Simpson. I feel like, uh, the prospects coming out of the US now is like a different breed because going back to the amateur days of these fighters, like they get taught a certain way. And I think that's a real effective style, hit and don't get hit. And they've always been taught that style. I just feel like Ennis has taken that style, hit and don't get hit, 
um, and he's taking it to a different level. Um, I mean, to be 23 years old and have almost 30 fights already is crazy. Um, so, yeah, okay, last fight, like I said, it happens. Um, I'm hoping the next year for him is different. Um, I want to see him step up against opposition. Um, I remember me and Jamie had a conversation on Twitter about who he should fight next. Um, there's talk of um, one like, there's talk of, you know, there's talk of um, fighting a top 10 board level guy like Yujas or someone, but I feel he's not ready for that level yet. Um, I want to see him meet someone of the caliber of Jamal James or someone just to see where he's at. Again, he's only 23 years old. Um, but yeah, to, for me, to be honest, I just want to see him carrying, carry on knocking people over. Um, so yeah, like I said, Gerald Ennis is my pick for prospect of the year. Yeah, a good pick. I feel like he's almost graduated from being a prospect, actually. I think I picked him for prospect of the year a few years ago um, and feel like he's starting to hit the borders of being the world level type of guy that we expect him to be. But in terms of we know how good he's going to be in the future, that kind of prospect thing, he's definitely going to be up there. Um, my pick is different to your guys. I kind of like the first category where I expected Tiafimo Lopez, I expected Belanga for this. Um, but I've gone for uh, Robesy Ramirez. And the reason for that is is because, you know, two-time Olympic gold medal, when he turned pro with top rank, I was banging on about him. Then he goes and loses his pro debut um, and makes me look very stupid. Um, and it was really disappointing because he, he waited three years to turn pro and it seemed like there was dedication issues. And one of his Cuban coaches actually said that he's got a bit of dedication problems. And then he lost and then he didn't look good in his second fight either. And it was kind of like, well, there's nothing to be excited about. But this year, in a year that's been struck by COVID and not a lot of people have been fighting, he's managed to fight six times. And in those six fights, he's got revenge over the guy, the guy that beat him, who's a little bit more handy than was actually given credit for. Um, and then, you know, he's gone and beat Felix Cabarello, not a great fighter, but, you know, Shukud Stevenson's been put in the ring with him earlier this year as well. So it kind of gives you an idea. And then he rounded off the year in December by beating a, a good fighter in uh, Brandon Valdez, who uh, um, had like a winning record of 13-1, and one, who's dangerous from Colombia. So I think Robesy Ramirez has had a good year and a lot of people are starting to see why people like me were excited about him. Um, and I think for prospect to win a prospect of the year, you've got to be active. You've got to be having the fights. It's, you, you can have the talent, but you've got to be having the fights. And that's actually one of the problems that was with Ennis originally, that when he had his promotional issues, he wasn't getting the fight. But uh, our reward for prospects of the year goes to Edgar Belanga. Um, Billy and uh, Michael also voted for him. And Alexis voted for Jesse Bam Rodriguez. Uh, so Belanga got most of the votes. So he wins prospect of the year. Um, like I say, we'll be announcing these officially on our social media in the coming days. But next up, we've got fight I of just, the year. Just to interrupt, Jamie, I've got to respect that you are, are doubling down on Robesy because if uh, he's definitely your your social media type of, you know, when sometimes something happens in a sport and if you've got an ego like me, you go and find your old tweets on it and quote tweet it and say, told you so. I mean, I don't know if you're quite as desperate for attention as that, but if Robesy ever does become a, a world champion, you definitely have that in your in your catalogue somewhere of being able to pull that out. Yeah, my notes section on my iPhone has got the links to all the good tweets I put out there. So it's got Jaron Ennis, got all of them. I'm just saving them for when they become world champions. Um, but the next category we're moving on to is the uh, the fight of the year. A fun one that I'm sure we all love. And uh, Scott, you're up first on this one, mate. Which one did you go for for fight of the year? I actually went for a woman's fight. I don't think many of you boys will have this, but it's um, Tasha Jonas v Terry Harper. I just look back. I was looking back at fights of the year so far. Oh, that one stood out to me. I thought that was an absolute cracking fight. Ends in a draw. I actually thought Tasha Jonas deserved the victory that night. Hopefully, we see a rematch next year. That was an absolute cracking fight. Yeah, that was a good fight. When I was um, doing this category, it wasn't like previous years where there were loads of picks. Me and Charlie were actually discussing it offline earlier. There wasn't like an immediate one that sprung to mind this year. And, um, you know, we spoke about it on the podcast. There was that fight camp sort of three or four weeks where there was just a good women's fight every week. So they definitely belong. And that's actually my pick of kind of women's fights this year. I thought that was a really good fight. So good shout for that one. Um, I'm next in the order. So the one I've gone for, and call me biased all you want, it's the best fight I've seen this year. And that's Juan Estrada against Carlos Quadras. Um, one of the things for me is when they fought a few years ago, you know, it was a good fight. 
Um, Estrada's improved massively since then. Quadras has kind of got a little bit worse. So I kind of saw this as just a stepping stone, really, for the Gonzalez fight. A good fight to keep him busy, but he'll come through it easily. And then he got dropped early on, and it was kind of like, oh, shit, he needs to step on it here. And I don't know whether it's a Mexican thing, but he kind of had the Juan Manuel uh, Marquez response, where when he gets dropped, he just tends to go into war mode and then just fires back. Um, And that fight, the way it ended, the way that Quadra sort of never gave up and rolled back the years a little bit, it's one of those fights where the loser, although they haven't got the victory, they come out of it in a positive light. And uh, I thought it was a really good fight, the way he ended it as well. I know that there might be a few shouts for uh, Jose Zapeda versus uh, Ivan Baranchik, because that was on my list as well. But the only reason I didn't go for it is because I felt it was a little bit sloppy. Um, Some of the knockdowns were a little bit weird almost. It just seemed like it was a bit lazy and a bit sloppy, and they got caught cold almost. Um, And this was more high level, and I just enjoyed it more. And I'm a bit of a sucker for all Mexican fights. I think they're, they're always entertaining. Next up, we've got Usman, which is your pick for this year. Um, I'm going to go with the fight you just mentioned, um, Ivan Zepeda. So Zepeda against Ivan Branchik. Um, simply because, you know, we're all purists here. We like seeing the sweet science. But every now and again, we all have a thirst for blood. Um, so Ivan's personally seen the fight live. So when I scrolled, I went, I was scrolling through Twitter the next morning and I'm seeing highlights of this fight. Um, it's literally, like you said, Jamie, it was sloppy. It was stupid. It was, it was almost comical at times. A bit like George Foreman and Ron Lyle. It was literally like, okay, I hit you, you go down. Now I'm going to work you, you go down. Now I'm going to work you, you go down. So, it's, yeah, it's like something you see out of a comedy skit. There was no quality involved. Um, and that's simply down to Baranchik style. Um, I'm sure British fat fans are familiar with Baranchik because um, uh, this fight with Josh Taylor. And I thought Taylor did well, but he did cause Taylor problems at times. Simply because of his style. He walks forward, he doesn't know when to take a backward step. Um, so yeah, going into this fight again, it's branching, it's all action, and I feel like with the fights that happened during the pandemic, with with no crowd, no atmosphere, almost, it's almost as if it's a glorified sparring session for these guys. So they're gonna, you know, sometimes sparring you go to war. It, hap- it, it took place in, in in these fights as well, and yes, yeah, back to Zapeda Baranchik, I feel like yeah, it was almost the only reason I'm picking it is because it was comical. It was like a throwback type of fight. Um, not much technique involved. Um, yeah, a lot of sloppy work. Um, I think the finish was the finish was something that you know I was quite impressed with the finish from Zapeda. Uh, to knock out Baranchik, it's no easy, it's no easy feat, and it looked like he's done it with ease. But um, I think yeah, just because of the whole entertainment factor, uh, which is what I went with when choosing fight. Yeah, I'm going to go with Zapeda versus Baranchik. Um, yeah, because it's something I feel is uh, that type of fight is an anomaly. Those type of fights don't come around often. Like, I can't recall the last time I saw one guy get dropped and the other guy comes back and he drops him. Another guy gets up and he drops him. And, uh, yeah, pure entertainment. Um, I'd love to see a fight like that again. Um, it's a fight I can sit through and watch from beginning to end and still get excited by it. So, yeah, that's my pick for fight of the year. Yeah, good pick. Um, like I say, the ending was uh, pretty special. Charlie, what have you gone for? Yeah, it's funny, actually, because all three picks that you guys have made in, in some way I kind of debated over today. Um, my, my, my immediate thought was what I'll come to in a second, but there was a, there was a, a feeling of, do you know what? We've had so many talks on the podcast and stuff about the women's fights that, that happened around that fight camp time that were so much fun and, and really propelled the women's boxing into, into um, going from sort of a side attraction to, I, I genuinely, I'm quite looking forward to them on certain cards. Um, and then, and then um, the Estrada fight as well was just, was magnificent. And, and that sort of became the obvious choice. And then, and then I remembered the fight that you just so happened to shit on Jamie before, before finishing off your, I mean, uh, Scott went first, Jamie went second. I thought, I can't believe it. No one said mine. And then you just shat all over it before me and Usman picked it. But, but my pick is the same as Usman's of Zapeda Baron Jack. And, and I mean, as you two will both remember as we was all on the podcast together, me, you and Usman that time of our favorite fight. And that was Nazim V. Kelly. And, and as Usman's saying, it has that, sort of um feeling of one went down and then the other one went down and it was just sort of back and forth of um i watched it in the morning and i just so happened to 
checked social media before I'd watched it. So I knew it had turned into a bit of a barnstormer, but there was a genuine feeling. I don't know if you remember the Tommy Coyle fight against uh, Scott Rule member. Scott, who was it? Tommy yeah. Coyle, when, when, they, when he went down about four times and won. Oh, um, Brazila. Yeah, that's I right. Forgot. And it was that type of, you genuinely at that point did not know who was going to take the win. It wasn't like one was really landing heavy and there was a couple of lucky knockdowns for the other guy. It was a genuine back and forth and, and the finish was magnificent as well. And yeah, that, that ultimately for me was fight of the year. Well, I was hoping you weren't going to say that because that uh, levels up our, our votes. Uh, so we got three votes for uh, Quadras and Estrada. So me, Billy and Michael all went for that fight. And then obviously we've got Alexis, Charlie and Usman going for Zapeda versus Brian. I think it's obvious Mr. Mr. Janes should decide which one wins it out of the Yeah, team. so that was my thinking. Scott Janes, it all lies on you. Which one did you prefer? Just go like that. Which one you enjoyed more? Zapeda. There we go. So Zapeda versus uh, Ivan Baranchik gets our Fighter of the Year award. Uh, fight of the Year award. Sorry. Um, so yeah, thanks for the defining vote, Scott. Next up, we've got a uh, a fun category, and I think we've we've talked a lot about the potential winner of this. Um, but what's interesting is the three votes we've had from other members of the team could sway this, and if another person votes for it, it could flip it entirely. So uh, this one's the performance of the year. And this one goes to uh, Charlie first. Yeah, this was an interesting one, actually, because, you know, as we've already discussed, that there's, um, there's not been as many fights as there would have been in a normal year. You know, there was the huge sort of gap of about five months in the end, really. Um, and, and nothing immediately sprung to mind and then and then when it did it became to me quite obvious um i think at the time i I thought this fight was in december turned out it was february um but it was it was tyson fury going over to america and 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 dethroning uh deontay wilder for for the second time really you know he'd been robbed in the first but i think what sort of um was just about was just about okay with him was his his sort of recovery in that final round and standing up and even though he had clearly won the rest of the fight just the fact that he hadn't been knocked out and and he had at least got a draw out of a fight that he undoubtedly deserved to win um but he could have he could have easily thought that was sort of my big chance to beat him you know I've outboxed him but but it didn't it it, it, in anything it re- reinforced for him how how clear of Deontay Wilder he was um in terms of a boxing IQ and and he just absolutely dismantled him and I mean if you fast forward till till now of what Deontay Wilder's become this sort of mumbling wreck of a man that that isn't even you know it's like like even now the, it's like he's not even on Dillian White's level in a weird way. Do you know what I mean? Like it's 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 almost like he's the challenger in a Dillian White fight. Which, when you really sit back and think about it, a year ago that was seen as a one-sided, absolute brutal KO on Deontay Wilder, and I still think it would be. But Tyson Fury seems to not have only got in his mind, has just destroyed everything about him to to a point where Deontay Wilder didn't even look like he believed in his own power in that ring that night and and yeah for me undoubtedly that was that was just the performance of the year I mean the whole story of Tyson Fury and what he came back from and stuff has been done to death so it doesn't need to be said anymore as you know everyone everyone knows it but just to when you really sit back and think of the sort of Klitschko performance so many years earlier um and then turning it on another time to to dethrone sort of the man with the man that's not Anthony Joshua in that in that that world title scene is just very very impressive and 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 I listen this isn't be- going to become a Tyson Fury v Anthony Joshua type thing tonight but it was a there was a lot of people not willing to get in maybe talking about getting in the ring with Deontay Wilder but not getting in and and Tyson Fury done it twice and and won the first one and was was robbed slightly but the second time there was absolutely no doubt okay thanks mate next up is Usman which one are you going for um wholeheartedly I'm going to go and agree with Charlie 
Exactly. Um, I was going to go with Charlo, uh, Jamel Charlo against Rosario, but it was not up to the level of, of Fury Wilder. I mean, but like Charlie said, the way he dismantled Wilder, nobody does that to Deontay Wilder. This is a guy who's had 42 fights, 41 KOs. He's knocked out everybody he's been in the ring with. Um, he's feared in the division. People fear him. Um, like, even I gave into the whole hype around Deontay Wilder. Um, I, I was never his biggest fan, purely down to boxing ability. But I kind of checked myself and said, you know what? It's heavyweight boxing. There's no need for technique. Um, you can get by on power, raw power, which is what, which is what Deontay Wilder carried. Um, it's evident. I don't need to go through the list of fights he's had. The record speaks for itself. Um, and even the first fight against Fury, I thought if he could do it once, he could do it again. Um, you know, it's 12 rounds of boxing. You're going to get caught one way or another. But the way, like Charlie said, he walked him down, he dismantled him, head, body. There was almost an element of fear in Wilder's eyes. Um, and again, everyone I speak to about the fight, I always refer back to the Kronk style because obviously he was training with Sugar Hill Stewart. And for those that don't know, Sugar Hill is the nephew of uh, Emmanuel Stewart who trained fighters such as Lennox Lewis, McClellan, Hans. And they all had a similar pattern in the sense their most dangerous combination would be the one-two, whether it's the, straight, whether it's the jab straight right or jab straight left. Um, that was the strongest combination. And the f- combination we dropped while there in the third round was a simple uh, jab right hand down the pipe and it connected right over here um, after that it was night night um, Wilder was finished the legs were gone um, even from the first solid jab which um, uh, yeah, Jamie's laughing he knows by um, even the first jab which Fury threw in the first couple of rounds again there was this element of fear in Wilder's eyes um, but yeah like Charlie said phenomenal performance to go to the champions home country, um, dismantle him the way he did, get into his head. Um, yeah, I don't think we'll see a performance like that over in the States for a British fighter for a while. So, again, I'm not Fury's biggest fan, but i got to give credit where it's due. Um, so yeah, Tyson Fury, Deontay Wilder, the rematch is my pick for performance of the year. Cool. Nice one, Usman. And uh, Scott, it's now you. Um, but just to let you know, the kick button is working. So if you pick AJ against Pulev, I'm going to use it. Do you know what? I would love to pick Anthony Joshua. I would love to, but after after pick Tyson Fury, I've got it written down right here, Tyson Fury. And um, what impressed me so much about Fury's performance is that he told Wilder, he told everyone what he was going to do. He said he was going to go out there, put it on him and stop him. And no one believed him. Everyone thought he was going to do the same thing, jab, move, boxing beautifully. But in the first bell, I was like, what's he doing? He's actually doing it. But he actually went out there, stuck it on him and knocked him clean out. performance the year 100% yeah so that's a clean sweep from you guys and it's a clean sweep from the rest of the lads as well Alexis Billy and Michael will pick that as well to be honest much like fighter of the year it's just between this and uh, Lopez Loma as well Um, but what made me pick Fury Wilder was that that like you've all said was the way in in which he done it he said he was going to do it no one believed him um, take, going in the ring against the most dangerous heavyweight, probably since George, George Foreman, in all honesty, going in against him and just putting him on the back foot, completely beating him up um, and showing a different side to Fury's game as well, which just shows that when he goes into other fights as well, whether it's against Joshua, Usyk, whoever it is, he can adopt that style as well. Um, and I think it just cemented his greatness. And for me, the way he done it, I just think that's the performance of the year. So that's another clean sweep. And uh, Tyson Fury wins our performance of the year for his stoppage win over Deontay Wilder in February. And now the uh, the next category is now one of the reasons I was just laughing. It's the knockout of the year or the night-night of the year, um, as we're going to call it. And uh, Usman, you're up first. I'll be shocked if you don't go for what I think you're going to go for. Can I, can I just say in the most sort of unprofessional, but it's Christmas-type fear... I'm going to go and get another beer. I already know Usman's pick because, because it's the same as mine. So I'll be back in a sec to give mine as well. Yeah, go ahead, Usman. Yeah, um, I think you all know what I was going to pick anyway. Um, Javante Davis, Leo Santa Cruz. Um, I'm surprised people, I think everyone was, would have been shocked if I picked anyone else. Um, if you know me, you know what Javante Davis means to me. This guy, he's my favourite fat, active fighter right now. Um, so yeah, I was banging on about how good he is. And when I saw that KO, it just kind of, it, it reaffirmed the, what everything I've been saying about him. Um, 
It was also, you know, it's 3 a.m., Channel 5. Um, he's exposed to a wider audience. Um, it, I believe it was the first fight back with fans. Um, you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure it was. Um, so, yeah, in front of 12,000 fans, he's got added pressure. And let's be honest, Leo Santa Cruz is no pushover. He's been in the ring with Frampton twice, and he's beaten him. He's been in the ring with top, top fighters. Um, I remember during the mail, on, he was on the mail with the Pacquiao undercard. And they were talking about him as a potential pound-for-pound pound star. And uh, leading up to the Davis fight, he'd only lost once against Frampton, which was a disputed decision as well. Came back to beat Frampton. And um, the same, like, there's always this argument around Tank that he's not dedicated, he's not this, he's not that. Um, and they were arguing that Leo Santa Cruz would be a big step up for Tank. Um, but listen, slip, left uppercut, there's your step up in class. Um, he's left in a heap on the floor. And I remember that fight, it was 3 a.m. in the morning. And um, see, like, I couldn't make any noise because it was too late in the night. So I'm sure you guys have experienced it when a, a knockout like that happens. And it's like your little, your little kid inside just starts jumping up and down. Um, but yeah, I went through that during that fight. And um, the reaction on social media, I read it did over a million views across all platforms. Um, and I'm not surprised because I personally have not seen someone in the lighter weights, ranging from junior lightweight, lightweight, featherweight, super featherweight. I haven't seen anyone hit as hard. Um, Inoue comes to mind, but again, Inoue's bantam weight tank ranges from junior lightweight to lightweight. So, yeah, um, it would be a surprise if I didn't pick anything else. I was going to go with White Vetkin, but simply out of bias, um, I'm going to stick with Javante Davis, starching Santa Cruz, sending him to a different realm. Uh, yeah, that's my pick. So uh, I know Charlie's just mentioned that he uh, he's going to agree with Usman, so I'll let him get his out of the way. So uh, you agree with that one, Charlie? Yeah, yeah, for me, undoubtedly. I mean, I mean, before I realised earlier this week that it was a, it we was doing a whole proper award ceremony. I was trying to be clever, and because I I didn't want to take Usman's moment of of really singing the Davis praise, but the moment I realised it was it was about what was sort of a group collective and what we all thought was was definitely the right pick. I mean, yeah, for me, un undoubtedly, it was a it was an absolute beautiful punch and. And and I feel like I feel like Davis would have won that fight with or without that punch. <clears throat> Even if he had gone twelve rounds, he would have still won the fight. But that just really, really capped it off for me. You know, it wasn't just a it wasn't just a knockout punch. It was as you know, as as Usman sort of alluded to, sort of punched to a different realm almost. You know, it was it was just something you can watch back over and over and over and, and really will be one of those that will just be in highlight reels for years to come. Um, as Usman said as well, funny enough, shout out to the to the Povetkin punch because also a, a, a beautiful punch that I'm not proud to say at very drunk at that point, I, I claimed it wasn't even a good punch. Um, watching it back, I was realised I was a very silly boy. But um, yeah, for me, for me, the, the KO of the year has to go to Javonta Davis. Okay. And uh, Scott, which one are you going for? I've gone for a, a weird one, an underdog. And that is Zelfa Barrett knocking out Eric Donovan. And that, if you remember back in the fight camp, I was talking about that was an absolutely brutal knockout. And what I loved about Eric Donovan, I love the guy fight week. He had, you know, he's telling a great story, and he was boxing years on Zelfa Barrett. He was, he was doing so well, and you know, Zelfa Barrett come back and knocked him out in you know brutal fashion. If you watch it back now, it's an absolutely brutal knockout. So for me, that's knockout of the year. Yeah, that was a, a vicious one. And I think if you're going for a British one, that's definitely up there. Um, we've pretty much got four votes for Tank Davis over Santa Cruz. That's going to be our winner. Um, but I just, I actually went the other way. I went for Povetkin White. And uh, the reason was, is because just the actual knockout itself is the way Davis was in the fight. And he, like you say, I think he was going to win it anyway. And he threw that same shot and Santa Cruz didn't react to it. And then it and it landed on the third or fourth time of throwing it in that same sequence, and then it knocked him out. And it was kind of I saw someone tweet saying, "What did you expect?" And that was kind of my thinking behind it as well. Was beautiful as the knockout looks, just on the eye, it's the best knockout of the year. But the reason I went for Povetkin White is because Povetkin looked looked shot. He just kept he was knocked down from punches that didn't look like should have knocked him down. 
Um, and he was trying to find it in the early rounds. He was trying to set up the shot, but credit to White, he was more switched on early on, and he and Povetkin couldn't quite find it. And then when he's been down twice, it looks like oh, it's just leading towards another White win. And uh, I was with Charlie and a load of friends when this happened, and kind of you noticed in the room the conversation starting to die out about the boxing because you just started expecting a White win. And then just looking up and seeing that punch land, the way he he tried setting it up the whole fight and then it eventually worked and just laid him out flat. Um, You know, Eddie Hearn saying he was up at the count of eight. He was completely out on the floor and kind of seeing all the the Russian contingency in the in the uh, in the garden going mental. Um, And it was just one of those ones where like Charlie's living room went from drunken conversation to screams and shock Um, and that it had that moment for me like the Tank Davis one had that like you said Usman where like at four in the morning you want to jump around your living room but this just with the other people there the fact that it looked like we were on route to another Dylan White win and then we were going to get all this mandatory bullshit for fucking 15,000 days or whatever time he's been mandatory Um, and then just the fact Povetkin ended it and I remember Scott saying in the chat like what happens now and it it had that feeling, whereas Tank, you're kind of like, yeah, he's going to go on to these Lopez and big fights that we expect. But the, what Povetkin done at his late age and after being knocked out by AJ, kind of seemed like he was done. So that's why it got my pick. But unfortunately, I'm overruled and so Scott. And it's uh, Tank Davis's KO of Leah Santa Cruz that wins the Night Night of the Year award. And uh, next up, we have Upset of the Year. Now, my pick might actually be featured in this, um, my knockout uh, call might be featured in this but uh, coming to you first Charlie what was your upset of 2020 what weren't you expecting yeah I must say I, I sort of prepared a whole speech for this that I feel like you've stolen a little bit just then um, in the, the neutral corner group chat um, Billy and Scott especially will know that you know we love a chat about odds and just sort of the value in in certain fighters and and, um, you know, going into 12th rounds and, and sort of putting in the odds of, of what price people are at that point. And, and that got me thinking of upsets, you know, when the longer the odds, surely the bigger the upset. And we've had two massive ones recently in, in, um, in the Daniel Dubois, Joe Joyce fight, and then even bigger in the Lyndon Arthur and the yard fight. But I mean, as we've already alluded to, very drunk this certain night. I wouldn't have known what price Povetkin was at that point, but after two knockdowns and very much looking like an aging Povetkin that was ready to be taken out by Deontay, um, Deontay Wilder, Dillian White, who would then go on and tell everyone about his 25,000 day um, uh, mandatory position. Yeah, I did outdo your 15,000 day. And, uh, you know, that I would love to have known the odds at that point because I imagine they were huge. And to to take him out at that point. So so my, my answer is Alexander Povetkin, not necessarily going into the fight because I think anyone that's ever watched Povetkin or Dillian White for that matter knew that that fight, there was every, every chance that Povetkin could win. But, but certainly at the point he won it, for me was the biggest shock of the year and just it just didn't look likely after he'd been dropped were heavy once and, and another shot that that looked like it looked like a man that was ready to go you know because the, the one of the knockdowns I didn't think were, was was necessarily great but it just looked like a man who was sort of ready to to cash in take his check and and get back to Russia and and to, to land that in those circumstances you know the the whole bubble thing and and that being the main fight of the four week um the four week experiment was just yeah, I, I, for me that was that was the most shocked I've been, and therefore, therefore the upset of the year for me. Yeah, good explanation, Charlie. Considering I stole most of it, you still managed to do a good job. Um, and you saying it was like the main fight of Fight Camp, and everything was building towards it. It was the last fight of Fight Camp as well, so it kind of ended on a note that we really didn't expect. So I can see why you've gone for it. Um, Scott, you're up next, mate. What did you go for for this category? Yeah, mine's Bebekin as well. Like. When it happened, I was walking around my living room, hands in my hair, going, did that really just fucking happen? Like, did that really just happen? Like, it literally was that. Like, Fetchin was down twice in the fourth round. You're just kind of sitting there thinking, like, you know, it's over. What White's, you know, going to fight for the title eventually. You carry on. It's 5,000 days, you know what I mean? He's going to get that. How it happened was just absolutely insane. 
Yeah. When I look back on 2020, I'll box in. I've got that knockout. Yeah, that thing stands out to me as the one. Okay, very nice. Usman, what have you gone for? We've actually, before we go into the final bits, we've got quite a nice split at the minute, so I'm quite intrigued to see what you go for. Um, I am not going to go with Wayne Povetkin. Um, I'm sure my pick probably hasn't made it to um, your guys' votes, but I'm going to go with um, Jason Rosario beating Julian Williams, um, only because um, I've followed J-Rock for some time, um, and I felt a personal connection, not to come across like, you know, but... Because, you know, he's, you know, humble background, Philly, you know, Muslim as well. I was quite humble. And I was quite, when he beat Jarrett Hurd um, last year, almost two years ago, I was not surprised because he's that type of fighter. He can adapt to any situation in the ring, Julian Williams. So when he beat Hurd, I wasn't, I wasn't quite surprised at the fact he beat Hurd. I was more surprised the way he beat Hurd. And I thought, you know what, it's well-deserved, unified champion. Let's see him in against Charlos. Let's see him move up and fight, you know, the big guns at middleweight, Golovkin, Canelo. Um, he deserves it, it's his moment. And I didn't see the fight. Um, again, I woke up, scrolled through social media, and I'm seeing Julian Williams lost. Um, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, I need to check this out. So I saw, and the manner in which he lost as well, um, he was working on eggshells. Um, uh, and it was a shock in the sense, I, didn't, I hadn't heard much of Jason Rosario beforehand. Um, and for me, Julian Williams was going to be the guy who'd unify and stay unified middleweight champion for the next two, three, four, five years. Uh, I believe he could have given little Charlo problems. Um, it would have been an amazing fight to watch, but, you know, enter, um, enter um, Jason Rosario, um, just, you know, put a spanner in the works. Um, and it was a shock. It was a shock also in the fact that in his next fight, Rosario kind of, you know, he got picked apart by little Charlo. And I think to myself, you know, Fighters have a performance like that once in a life. They pull performance out of their neck. Because um, if you put Rosario in against Williams again, I don't think he'll be able to pull off, pull off the same result. So that's my pick for upset of the year. Jason Rosario, Julian Williams. Um, only because, of course, I was shocked because Rosario just beat the unified champion. But also the fact the fights, the potential fights Williams would have been in, like I just mentioned, um, they wouldn't have the same glamour and attraction around them as they would have. You know, an undisputed fight has so much more glamour than just a normal fight, if you get what I mean. So, yeah, um, Charlo, sorry, Rosario and Williams is my pick for upset of the year. Yeah, you had the same thinking as me, actually. That's the uh, the pick I went for. I, um, I've i been quite good at calling the light middleweight scene over the past couple of years. And I remember in 2019, I gave uh, Julian Williams the performance of the year for beating Hurd. And I remember at the time, Charlie was one of the people I spoke to about it. He said, you really fancy Williams to beat Hurd? And he's a very talented fighter, but his problem is his chin. He does get caught as to what happened when he fought the bigger Charlo. Um, ultimately happened against Rosario, but it was a shock because Williams, that that big double Charlo double header in September that was supposed to be Williams Charlo. There was no doubt about it. PBC had it organised and Rosario proper threw a spanner in the works. And it was just one of those fights where I sort of, when I woke up in the morning to check the result and watch it was just like, Oh fuck, I didn't expect that. So that's, that would be uh, my upset of the year. However, I think I'm going to change it. And that is because we've got a three way tie. So, We've got two votes from Alexis and Billy for Tiafimo Lopez against Vasil Lomachenko. We've got two votes, Charlie and Scott for Povetkin and Dillian White. And then two votes, me and Usman, Jason Rosario versus Julian Williams. And then Michael actually went for Lyndon Arthur against Anthony Yard. Um, so unfortunately, that's only got one vote, so that's not included. Now, I'm actually going to change my vote. And because it didn't win knockout of the year, and listening to Charlie and Scott has reminded me of just how shocked I actually was that night. I do think Povetkin against White does deserve it. Um, so I'm going to go towards that way. And uh, Alexander Povetkin knocking out Dillian White is a, uh, our upset of the year for 2020. Uh, next up, we have trainer of the year. And I have uh, Scott up first to talk about this one. Who have you picked for trainer of the year, mate? I've actually gone for Sugar Hill's Derrick Old Tyson Fury's trainer. Just to repeat on, you know, he had that one fight with Tyson Fury, took him from that one fight only. He was same as Tyson, saying, we're going to do this. I'm going to train Tyson to knock people out. I'm going to get his punching power up. And he did exactly that. So for me, you know, performance of the year. There's no, you know, he deserves training of the year as well for me. Oh, nice one. Charlie, what did you go for, mate? 
Yeah, I forgot you included this category, I'll be honest. Um, again, Christmas, isn't it? So we'll <laughs> let that go. I think that's the excuse at this time of year for most things. Um, except for the SpongeBob SquarePants story earlier. There is never, ever an excuse for that. Um, but I think, I think Calvin Ford is who I'll go for. Um, mainly because Javonta still has, and I mean... As discussed on the podcast before, there is a bit of a, a fanboy club within Neutral Corner, but it's chaired by by Mr. Usman. Um, and I'm I'm merely just just the young boy in it. But he there is there is question marks around Javonta Davis who who, you know, does he have that passion? Does he have he clearly has the skill set, but I feel his him going into that Santa Cruz fight and 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 whether it be Karen Ford or or, or Floyd Mayweather, I'm not sure, but I'm going to give him the credit here and say that um, he's kind of got him in that headspace where he's he's now putting everything together. And we watching watching that performance back from Leo Santa Cruz, there should be an absolute excitement and barrage for for him v Tiafimo Lopez and him v. I, I think Ryan Garcia, once he beats Luke, Luke Campbell, Devin Haney, and onwards and upwards through through the weights, um, Javonta Davis should be one of one of these guys that we're just ultimately really really excited about, and 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 I'm going to give his trainer the credit for it. Yeah, he's definitely done a great job getting a uh, Tank back in shape. I mean, Tank making 130, it just, just shows you he's dedicated. Because if he's not dedicated, he doesn't make the weight. Um, so Calvin Ford's done a good job. Scott clearly doesn't agree because he walked off in anger. Um, but Usman, who have you gone for? I was wondering, actually, when Charlie said Calvin Ford, whether you're going to go the same route. Uh, yeah, no, I was going to say Calvin Ford. Um, but no, my pick for the last week or so, or whenever you told us to pick a trainer of the year, was um, Eric James. Um, for those who don't know who Derek James is, he trains Errol Spence and Terence Crawford, two unified champions at World. Uh, sorry, Errol Spence and uh, Jamel Charlo, the two unified champions at light middleweight and uh, welterweight. So, and I think he deserves credit for the fact that he's turned firstly for Jamel Charlo, because um, when I remember Jamel Charlo coming on the scene, he was an uh, a boxer. He was a good inside boxer, pure boxer, good jab, range right hand. Since he's been with Derek James, Slack has turned into a sort of uh, a boxer puncher in the mould of Tommy Hearns, that type of fighter. Uh, it's evident his last few performances, um, he stopped Rosario with a jab to the body. Um, even before that, when he absolutely starched Lubin in a round. Um, the Williams performance as well, it was like a, a boxer puncher performance. A uh, second fight I'm talking about. He just walked Williams down, walked through his punches and uh, eventually knocked him out. Um, and i got to give James credit for the game plans because Charlo looks a completely different fighter um, compared to what he was before. And I feel he's a dangerous, dangerous fight for anyone ranging from light middleweight to middleweight. Um, so that's the Charlo side of things. And in regards to Errol Spence, um, he deserves credit for, you know, Spence, he's got a top resume. He's got an amazing resume. You look through the names he's beaten, you know, Kel Brook in Sheffield, Danny Garcia, Mikey Garcia, Sean Porter. Um, and I believe uh, Lamont Peterson also, and I think he looked good in those fights as well, especially the Brook fight. Uh, again, credit to his trainer, Derek James, for setting up those game plans. Um, I was impressed with Spence because in the Porter fight, he showed that he can mix it with Porter and there was times he could outbox Porter as well. So I feel if he stays with James, um, he can be a problem for anyone, maybe up to middleweight if, if, that's, if that's a limit he can get to. Um, but yeah, that's my pick for trainer of the year, simply because he's the only, also the only trainer in the sport of boxing who's got two fighters who are unified champions in their respective weight classes. So yeah, that's my pick for trainer of the year. Yep, you uh, you took my pick again. I uh, I've gone for that as well. Um, like you say, two unified champions. But if you just look at the wins, Charlo against Rosario is one of the wins of the year. And it wasn't just that Charlo showed once again he's a, a like heavy-handed and caught him and took him out. He, he was winning rounds and he, he's elevated really under Derek James where his style has really changed and really impressed with him that night. And even Errol Spence, I said that he beat Garcia a little bit more convincingly than people expected. And that's down to Derek James. I think he's done a great job with him. Um, and I don't think there's many other trainers. And a lot of this is down to COVID as well. 
um, and fighters not necessarily having the fights. But I don't think many trainers this year can say they've had two really good wins like that. Um, we look at the other picks on the team. Billy and Michael went for Eddie Reynoso. I think every year in boxing, he's in with a shout um, because just the fighters he works with. Um, so we've actually got two picks for Eddie Reynoso, um, three picks for Derek James, uh, one Sugar Hill and one Calvin Ford. So Derek James is our trainer of the year for 2020. So congratulations to him. It's well deserved. And the next category is a bit of a fun one. There's less importance on this one, but we're still going to... Uh, Saviour this tweet, like Charlie mentioned, for when this person hits the heights we expect. So we're doing a one to watch for 2021 category. Um, I'm going to go first on this one because I don't think I've been first yet. But my pick is someone that I nearly went for for prospect of the year, but he's been a tiny bit inactive, which has disappointed me. Um, but Jesse Bam Rodriguez down at light flyweight. I've mentioned before that it's my favourite division in the sport. Um, my last last couple of years, like Usman, I've been banging on about Jaron Ennis, but I thought it was time to switch it up. Um, and just such an exciting fire at 20 years old. He's got so much power. And one of the reasons I've picked him as my one to watch is the fact that he's ranked two with the WBA and the WBO which pretty much means he's either in a final eliminator next year or he's challenging for the title. So one of the reasons you should watch him is he's going to be in big fights. That's pretty much guaranteed for the young fighter. And it's just scary that he's only 20 years old, trained by Robert Garcia. So he's working with great fighters in the gym. His brother's uh, Joshua Franco, the champion at Super Flyweight. So he's got that, you know, boxing's in his blood. Um, and I just think some of the fights available to him at light flyweight, that especially Elwin Soto, the Mexican, I think that's a great fight in America. Um, and you just look at his year, you know, after lockdown, when he came back and top rank were putting on all them shows, he knocked out uh, Juan uh, Yanwell Rivera. Um, and it was one of the knockdowns of the year. It was just like the way he took him out was blistering. And then he rounded off the year against uh, Juarez, Sol Juarez, who has fought the best at minimum weight, light flyweight, flyweight, and has never been stopped by them. And um, Jesse Bam Rodriguez just goes and cleans him out in two rounds. Um, frightening power, frightening potential at 20 years old. And I think in the next couple of years, he's one to watch. But given his high ranking in the, in the, uh, in the governing bodies next year, you're going to see him in some really good fights. And the problem with the lower weights is they don't always get the respect or the attention they deserve. But on top rank, Bob Aaron seems to be really excited about him. And with the, you know, the Estradas and Gonzalez fight next year, a new way just being down at those weights, we're starting to see some more attention to those weights. So keep your eye out for Jesse Bam Rodriguez. Charlie, I'm going to come to you next. Who's your one to watch for next year? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of cheating a little bit um, and, and putting forward, forward two, but but one, one mainly. Um, so my main one is is a one that I'm sure anyone that anyone that's ever li listened to me sort of talk boxing and, and future stars and stuff is Virgil Ortiz. You know, I love the guy, and I feel like a, a little bit he has that inactivity to his name as well, and 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 needs something to really blast himself into next year. But I do have this funny feeling that he will at this point next year, and this could bite me on the arse a little bit. And as I was saying earlier about having the ego of wanting to retweet stuff, and this could be one that, that sort of comes against me. But I feel like this point next year, we'll be talking about a guy that hopefully came over to England and, and wiped out a prospect or a, or someone who, I've, I mean, I've seen his name linked with, with Connor Benz and stuff. And I know, I know Jaron Ennis did as well. Um, I'm hoping Ortiz sort of gets the nod because I think whichever the two, if they did sort of get that fight, would would absolutely blast him out and and show him that that it sort of levels to this to this game in a way is a, is a real thing. But yeah, Virgil Ortiz for me is is the guy that I really really hope that next year places himself in certain fights and little bit of a spoiler for a future uh, future round of one of these questions he comes in again where he gets that that kind of step up fight and that that fight that really puts his name into it and and he seems quite quite big at golden boy and they they really seem to see him as as the as the next one through um and i do feel like in a year's time we will be we will be talking about a guy who's had um a couple of fights next year maybe three but but certainly one that we're really, really talking about and, and, and one that we 
we sort of see as 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 the the one that puts him at least in the scene. The other one, just sort of for 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 Scott's benefit, because I know like like him and me, we both love the British scene. Um, Willie Hutchinson, I feel like he really has. He re- he's at a point now where he's just proving that going in with these journeymen and 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 slight prospects are just just worthless to him, and he, and it's time to step up. And I'm I'm really hoping this point next year we're talking about Willie Hutchinson in at least in with um with in fights that we that we really want to see because British fighters seem to be doing it more and more. You know what we've already spoke about the two fights with Dubois and, and, um, and Joyce and, and Arthur and, and Yard. There are fighters, the British fighters out there that, and there's a scene for Hutchinson in the British, the British uh, scene to, to really get involved in. And I'm hoping at this point next year, we're talking about him as the brightest spark in there or, or at least one of them. Yeah, very nice. Um, just to quickly mention, when we say one to watch, every name that we're going to be mentioning is technically one to watch next year because they're all top talents. Um, coming to you next, Scott, who who's your pick? I've actually gone for a, quite a weird one, actually. <laughs> yeah, for, former heavy, former heavyweight world champion hasn't fought this year. Any guesses who it is? Any guesses? So, what well, was the second bit you lagged? Hasn't uh, fought this year. Hasn't fought this year. Uh, also, also, Scott, just just for the record, for in future, when saying any guesses, give us at least two seconds to have a guess. <laughs> Even any guesses instantly, instantly after saying no, the word. No, no one got it. All right, okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> I was, I was going to say it's not Andy Ruiz, is it? Vladimir Klitschko. Vladimir Klitschko. Oh, for real, Andy Ruiz. And um, Andy Ruiz. There you Len- go. Lennox Lewis. <laughs> no, no, I'm being serious. And Ruiz <laughs> next year is one, one to watch to me. Seems that of anyone else. So, you know, you know, I love Joshua. You know, not Joshua out, but you know, next year I, th- I believe he's one to watch. Yeah, no, it definitely it has been disappointing that he hasn't fought this year. Um, and there's a lot of good fights available to him. Um, so a nice pick. And when we said one to watch, we didn't just mean prospects. We mean fighters that are going to be in good fights next year that you should keep an eye out for. So uh, Usman, we're going to round it off with you. Who have you gone for? Um, I've gone for a little bit of a prospect as well. I've gone for Chris Colbert. Um, I've simply gone for Chris Colbert because um, the last beginning of, or well, say it was end of 2019, he fought uh, Beltran. He knocked out Beltran in a year. And he didn't fight for a whole year. And I think recently, again, after Beltran, he fought Jezreel Corrales. Um, and in those two performances, I think he looked quite good. Um, his nickname is Little B-Hop. For those who don't know, it's Bernard Hopkins. Uh, and again, he's built in the same mould as Bernard Hopkins. He's got the same style. Um, and recently, he beat, I don't know how to pronounce the name, uh, Ar- Arboleda, Arboleda. I love those Arboleda, names. yeah. Arboleda, yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, he beat him recently in his last fight, not too long ago. Um, he's had 15, 16 fights right now. Um, he's already the interim champion, that super featherweight. Uh, the WBA, um, we all know who holds the super feather, uh, super belt at WBA, it's Javante Davis. And I think if Colbert can get a couple more, I wouldn't say world level wins, I'd say wins against fighters who are fringe world level. Um, so, you know, maybe someone like Machado or Machado, Alberto Machado, someone along those lines. Um, I think he can introduce himself as a major player within boxing because I feel there's people out there that don't know more about um, I know a while back he had that Netflix documentary in which he was featured uh, Counterpunch. Uh, but since then, I feel like he's also in the type of mould of fighters such as Virgil Ortiz, um, where not many people know of him, but those that do know of him think he can achieve quite um, something substantial in boxing um, and like I said he's already got the interim belt at super featherweight um, hopefully he racks up a few wins and he looks good in those few wins as well um, I lacked him fight on a major pay-per-view on the card maybe headline a um, non-pay-per-view broadcast somewhere against a top name like Machado or someone um, and hopefully he gets a few wins we get the big fights against people like Davis, Bachel, you know um, but yeah for me Chris Colbert is one to watch out for next year yeah, great knockout the other week, and uh, he's yeah, got yeah. The, he's got the uh, the American sort of flashiness. Um, and you saying about him against Tank, I think the trash talk would be brilliant there. He's got the personality, and I think yeah, he's definitely one to watch next year with uh, the Showtime backing. Um, we're going to go into our final section, and it's not actually a category, so we've wrapped up for all the awards. And just to mention briefly. Um, 
basically these these next bits that we're going to do are just basically three fights a discussion that each of us want to see next year um some of them may already be happening they might have been scheduled and we're just looking forward to seeing them and some of them might be ones that you know haven't been made yet but we want to see them happen before we do get into that, that though anyone that follows the uh, the neutral corner quite seriously will know that we have an internal sweepstake and uh it is now time to announce the results of the sweepstake because as we mentioned before in terms of the awards we run from christmas to christmas so that's how the sweepstake works as well and we're actually me and charlie have been talking about ways in which we can get you guys involved as well we're going to start doing things where we're going to challenge our listeners and see if they can beat us in the sweepstakes on on weeks where there's 10 15 big fights that we can talk about um we'll get you guys involved and see if you can beat us and outdo us but uh the sweet steak updates in seventh place we have alexis with 148 points feel a bit bad for him because he's missed four weeks and uh he has plenty of notice to be fair so there is that but he's uh he blames the time zone which is kind of fair i suppose in sixth place who escapes the neutral corner tattoo which i'm really pissed off about is uh, Scott James with 160 points. Um, fifth place, we have Billy with 178, who, fair play to Billy, had a really poor start and has come back into it in the last few weeks and has taken some risks on his picks and they've paid off. In fourth place, and I think he'll be pissed off at himself about this, is Michael with 181. He was in second place throughout the whole thing um, and then basically in the last few weeks has kind of fallen off. So Michael in fourth place. In third place is Usman. Again, like Billy, you started pretty badly and you've really grown into it. Uh, so fair play to you. Second place is Charlie with 184 points. Charlie, you started strong, sort of dipped out a little bit and then finished strong. So you've come back into it. So you're the runner up. And then in first place is me with 197 points. That's the 13 point lead. And in the words of David Brent, that's a landslide. Um, so don't want to say I'm an expert or anything, but uh, looking forward to winning again next year. There was supposed to be a prize for the winner, um, but obviously, technically, I'm the founder of the Neutral Corner, so I can't prize myself. So you, the uh, what the rule is, is you guys have to come together. And I, th I think you was quoted earlier on in the week of saying, do you reckon I could get 50 quid out of the boys each? Yeah, each. That's not total, that's each. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that coming in the post, guys. Uh, I know it's Christmas, but I don't want any bullshit about delivery times and that. I want it here soon, before the new year. Um, but, yeah, like we say, guys, we're going to be updating on socials about how we can get you guys involved next year. I think it's going to be quite fun. We're going to come together as a team and make our picks and then go up against you lot and see if you can beat us and there'll be prizes at stake for you guys. Now, we're going to get into our final discussion and it's three fights we want to see for 2021. We're going to go to Scott first. Give us three fights you want to see. Oh, we're not doing awards this, are we? No, this is just a general conversation. Oh, oh, that's, 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 I've gone for three, like, just completely, like, they're not the big fights. They're not like Joshua Fury's, and, you know, they're not the big ones. Just three fights that, firstly, I want to see. And that's um, Lawrence O'Coley v. Breedis. Well, that's CV Joe Smith and Joe Cordina v. Joe Joe Diaz. Okay, very nice. I yeah. think they're three in, interesting fights. I love Cordina. I think you know, he's been very active. He's actually fought this year. I think so. But, you know, I think he's a great prospect. Uh, hopefully that fight could happen at the end of the year. But we'll actually, Joe, uh, Joe Smith, hopefully, you know, end of next year. Same as with Cody Breeders. Hopefully that end of next year. You know, all three of them are 2016 um, Rio Olympians. They are you know, both prospects. All three of them prospects. Hopefully these three fights happen. I'd love to see them. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, actually. It's the uh, GB 2016 Olympians. You want to see them all step up, as we do. We all, it's coming on to five years now since they were in Rio, so they do need these fights. Um, next up, we've got Usman. What are the three fights you want to see in 2021? Um, like Scott said, personally, I want to see I want to see Javonte Davis against Tiafimo Lopez, um, only because, again, it will be an undisputed, a sort of undisputed fight at lightweight. Um, again, like I said, Javonte Davis is my guy. Um, I want to see him in the big fights against your Haney's, against your Lopez's, um, I guess even Linares maybe. But yeah, the fight, first fight is Javante Davis against Tiafimo Lopez. And I feel that would be a big number in the US as well because I feel like Davis and Lopez are two guys who are quite marketable in the sense that, you know, because um, there's always a lot, there's a lot nowadays in boxing, there's a big social media presence. And I feel like they're two guys who are always into that type of social media bubble, if you get what I'm trying to say. Um, so yeah, that's a fight I want to see. Um, 
I do kind of want to see Davis shut Lopez up because, okay, you've beaten Lomachenko. Now prove yourself. Um, stick, in, stick it in with the big fish. Go fat your Haney's. Go fat your Davises. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, because in my personal opinion, they're the two best lightweights at the moment. Uh, whatever happens with Lomachenko is whatever. But for now, I think Lope, uh, Tiafimo, Lopez and Davis are the two best lightweights. And I want to see them square off because it will also be a throwback to the old days as well. Uh, 80s, 90s, you know, you had your Leonard, Hearns, Duran, uh, similar to that. Not exactly the same because obviously Hearns was a different weight, but um, it's good to see depth at lightweight again. I feel like it was a division quite dead in the water not too long ago before Lomachenko had come around because champions, you know, Linares. Um, I'm sure uh, the guy who crawled beat it was Darlis, was it Darlis Perez? Um, even he had, had a belt. So it was a division that was dead in the water. Um, and hopefully they can get that fight made for 2021. Uh, the second fight I want to see is a fight I think every boxing purist wants to see is um, Spence and Crawford. Uh, only because I've been watching Spence for quite a while. I've also been watching Crawford for quite a while. Um, I don't really have a, a, a connection to the two. It's just the fight I want to see because I feel that, again, they're the two best welterweights on the planet. Um, it'll be a good clash of styles because every time I come up in the, uh, this fight comes up in conversations. Um, I feel Crawford, Spence is huge for welterweight and Crawford, I feel, remember, he's a natural lightweight, like welterweight. So I do feel if that fight happens, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Um, and hopefully the both, the pair of them can get the promotional issues and whatever issues they have sorted, whether it's money, whether it's contract, because as boxing fans, we don't want to be starved of these fights. Um, so that's another fight I want to see, only because, again, it will be another undisputed fight. you got the guy who holds the WBO and the WBA belts, I believe. Or is it just the WBO belt? You know, we'll have to correct me on this. Crawford's WBO and then just WBO. Got WBO and WBF and WBC. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pacquiao's so, got um, WBA at the minute. Yeah, it's all confusing with all the belts and everything. But um, I did hear the roadmap was for Spence to fight Pacquiao and Crawford to fight Porter and the winner fights one another. Um, so hopefully... If Spence fights Pacquiao, it would be a good profile builder for Spence because Pacquiao's a huge name. Whatever people think of him, even if he fights till he's 50, he's a huge name in box, not even boxing, in sport. So um, hopefully Spence can do a job on Pacquiao if that fight happens. Um, and then he goes on to fight Crawford, who I do hope if the Porter fight happens, he looks good against Porter because Porter's a tough night to work for anybody. Um, so yeah, let's hope them two get it on um, sometime maybe early, uh, late to... Uh, mid next year I'd be happy to see that and the third fight I want to see is um, it's a fight everybody wants to see it's Joshua Fury um, I feel not just because of the fight itself and the clash of styles but also when it comes to the British not many can do an event like us um, I remember when Joshua fought Klitschko it was not just a huge fight um, the event itself when it came back the whole build up um, the, the pair of them going into the Sky Studios and it was just packed with fans um, I felt like the whole word on the street was Joshua Klitschko, Joshua Klitschko. And I feel if Fury and Joshua ever come to terms on a fight, it will be similar. Um, it will be a sporting event. And I don't think we'll see a sporting event like that ever. Because um, I feel we could do a lot for the economy of the country as well. And there is talk of, uh, as a big fight between two British fighters, Wembley. Uh, but hopefully the situation the world's in now sorts itself out soon and we get to see that fight. Um, but yeah, Joshua Fury, also in terms of boxing, it's the clash of styles. You've got the puncher slash, when he wants to be boxer, up against most of the time, the pure boxer in Fury. Um, and people, they tend to say Fury will beat Joshua easily, Fury will beat Joshua easy, but I don't see it because Joshua himself says um, about the Ruiz fight, he goes, you put me down four times, you couldn't stop me. Um, so I do feel like to beat Joshua, you have to cleanly knock him out. Otherwise, he keeps getting back up. Obviously, he has been beat, but to beat him again. Same with Fury. Same goes for Fury. Um, I can't remember who said it, but they said to beat him, you have to nail him to the canvas. And um, if anyone can nail him to the canvas, John Tarada almost did it. But I feel Joshua's got the closest in terms of power. Because when I compare the two, I see Joshua's power is the type of power where he can probably hurt you with a combination. You know, he'll drop you with a combination. Whereas Wilder could switch your lights out with one punch. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see how Fury fares up against someone who throws in volume as well, because Joshua is a volume puncher everywhere, I believe, and there's not many heavyweights who throw in volume. Um, so yeah, they're the three fights that kind of outlined for the year, and hopefully 
we can get one, at least one of those three on, um, it'll be good to watch, man. Yeah, definitely. I actually, in my picks, avoided the kind of Spence Crawford and Joshua Fury because I think we, you speak for everyone when you say that you want to see those fights. And you saying about, you know, to, to take Joshua out, you sort of have to nail him to the canvas or he just quits, in the words of Charlie. Um, Charlie, what are your uh, three fights for 2021? Yeah, like you, I, I, I've avoided the big two. Um, yeah. Terence Crawford and Errol Spence is undoubtedly, for me, the fight that I would that I want to see ahead of any other. Uh, Fury Joshua comes with two caveats, one big, one slightly smaller. The slightly smaller one is that it has to be for all four belts. Um, it's a slightly smaller one because if they have to give one up, I can swallow it, but, but I do feel like it makes sense to be all four. And the second one is it simply has to be at Wembley in this country. Two British boxers simply has to be over in this country. You know, if the moment they start sending it to Saudi, taking belts away, I'm I'm simply not as invested in it anymore. Whether, you know, I thought Groves for Callum Smith was absolutely huge. The moment it went over to, to Saudi, I just I just simply wasn't as invested in it. And 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 as much as I want to see Joshua Fury, I'm not aching for it. I'm not I'm I'm not a massive fan of either, so therefore it's not like I'm I'm not losing sleep over it. Crawford v Spence has always been the one I wanted to see more, so I'm leaving those two out. Um, I'm going more down the Scott route of of stuff I want to see. First one is is one that I love Canelo and and I want to see him in a big fight next year. And I sort of um the nod over a lot of things. Charlo sort of came up in my head. Golovkin three came up in my head. Um, I almost merged the two other one six eight champions in Plant and, and and Saunders as a as a one fight basis of him wiping it, and then I realised, you know what, this man is just a freak, and I want to see if he truly can take out um, a light heavy, and and if he's going to go up there, he may as well take on the best one in Baturbiev. So I want to see just how ridiculous Canelo can get. And I would like to. I'd, I'd just. I'd like to see him in with who I have as the best light heavyweight on the planet. And if he goes up there and does do that, I mean, I know we've seen a lot of a lot of the matchroom staff, I guess these days, as, as some of them aren't even boxed anymore, start to plug the. He must be juiced up. Nonsense. I mean, I can only imagine how their head will explode if he goes up there and and does Baturbiev. So that was my first. Um, second was uh, was. Um, something I alluded to earlier of where I see Virgil Ortiz going and, and, and him having this sort of breakthrough fight and this step up of everyone saying, wow, he really is on that type of level um, in with someone who, if I'm a, if I'm a Virgil Ortiz fanboy, someone who I've been um, deemed a fanboy of for the last five, six, seven years, Danny Garcia, I would absolutely love to see it. Virgil Ortiz get that step up fight against the real name of the division and, and, and someone who, if he beats, he will, coming back to what I said earlier of, of, of sort of who to watch for in 2021, if he takes, if he puts Danny Garcia on his resume, um, I feel like we're talking about a real, a real um, prospect of 2022, of, of just what fights you then put Virgil Ortiz in, um, especially if, if, if Spence and, and uh, Crawford finally do get it on and, and maybe then vac- vacates happen and stuff and belts come up. Virgil Ortiz for me will then at 147 definitely pick up a belt. And then finally, um, Teofimo Lopez and, and Javonta Davis, like like Usman said, I would love to see. Um, I do feel though that Teofimo Lopez deserves his sort of place in the sun a little bit. After beating Lomachenko, who not many, not me, but not many, gave him a chance in um i feel like i'd like to see javonta and um devon haney and and ryan garcia also beat vasil lomachenko to prove that they they sort of deserve that shot so something that i i wasn't 100 percent sure of originally when it first got touted and now i cannot get out of my head i can't stop thinking can you imagine if he also does that after after sort of taking out Vasil Lomachenko and taking all the belts. I know Devin Haney argues he hasn't taken all the belts, but he is the undisputed lightweight champion in the world at the minute. Is to then go up 
and take on Josh Taylor after beating Ramirez. For me, Josh Taylor v. v. Tiafimo Lopez is just a fight I'm now desperate to see. And um, I'm a massive fan of Josh Taylor, but to think to think Tiafimo Lopez is next to uh, like his last fight against Vasil Lomachenko for all the belts at lightweight and then going up to 140 and again fighting for literally all the belts and, and potentially winning. I know his hashtag is sort of the takeover. It really will be the takeover. So, so yeah, those three fights for me are the fights I'd, I'd personally like to see in 2021. Yeah, all very nice fights. Um, actually, the rest of the team, when they sent their picks in, sort of mentioned the same one. So they mentioned the Spence and the Crawfords. The Canelo and Batervievs came up from Michael and um, from Billy as well. Um, Michael also mentioned Lopez Taylor at 140. It was going to be on my list, but the only reason I didn't include it is because I don't think it can happen. I think Taylor's um, kind of wrapped up for 2021. I think you see him fight Ramirez for the Undisputed, then he has to defend against Jack Catterall in the UK. Um, but for 2022, that's that's definitely a fight. Um, my three fights, I tried to go a little bit outside the box. Um There's some that are already going to happen. You know, there's Estrada and Gonzalez, which anyone that knows me sort of knows how much their sort of personal value their first fight holds. And the second one is now set for March, so I didn't include that. Taylor Ramirez didn't include it. Uh, Josh Warrington versus Kanzu, I've been banging on about. It's going to break all the punch stats. I want to see that, but I feel like it's going to happen. I've seen her mentioning it a lot, so I'm not going to include it. And the three ones I went for is a light heavyweight one, and it's a unification but probably not the one people are expecting. Um, Art of Atervio against Joe Smith Jr. Joe Smith Jr. fights for the vacant title against Maxine Vlasloff um, in February. And if he wins that, it's just such a good fight. You expect Atervio to win, don't get me wrong. But you think of the type of fight he had with Callum Johnson, where it was just an all-out firefight. Joe Smith is just a much better version of Callum Johnson, has the same sort of power um, and going into that fight, I think you just see someone get knocked out and both of them get hurt at some point. And I think it's just fun while it lasts. And not to mention that they're both with top rank. It's fairly easy to make. They've nearly fought each other before. Um, so, yeah, I think that's one that can happen. The second one, um, to be a bit of a boring purist, but down at like Flyway, which is my favourite division, is uh, Guy Gucci versus Ken Shiro. Um, we love it when we see someone become the definitive number one at a weight and them two, it's argued who is the number one at the weight. And I think them two, Japan, love their boxing and those super fights that happen in Japan kind of always go down in history. Um, and I'd love to see them two have a fight. The only reason I'm a bit sceptical is that sometimes these big fights don't don't happen and Ken Shiro was in a lot of trouble this year for a uh, drink driving accident thankfully it was before the episode where Charlie encouraged our listeners to drink drive so uh, we can't get in trouble for that thankfully but it's just such a good fight and anyone that knows those lower divisions just know that that's the fight from flyweight minimum weight whatever weight down there that's the fight that we need to see just two great clash of styles and a definitive number one at live flyweight and then lastly a bit of a weird one maybe um, but Shakur Stevenson versus Miguel Burchell. Um, I went for that because much like Lopez versus, versus Lomachenko, I just love it when one of these young fighters who's got so much hype and all to lose just goes, fuck it, and just takes the fight. And Burchell's a good fighter. He's dangerous. He comes forward. And it's the typical... I'd say brawler, Burchell's better than a brawler, but it is his natural style, the come forward style. Against the boxer, it always makes for good fights. And I just want to, Stevenson seems like he really wants it as well. That's the thing I like about it. And Stevenson's not just going up to super featherweight and is going to try and get, you know, an easy title. He's not trying to get a vacant belt. He wants Burchell. And I think that's such a good fight because if Stevenson wins, he's as good as we say he is. He's, I've watched him since he was a teenager. I watched him in the US qualifiers against Ruben Villa um, when he'd lost to Villa and then come back in the all-important qualifier and beat him. I've always been really high on Stevenson. I was a bit disappointed when he lost in the Olympics. Um, And I think that fight is just those, one of those sink or swim fights for a young prospect where if they win, that's it. Like Tiafimo Lopez, you go, he's he's legit. He's pound for pound. Um, And that's the one one I want to see. So there are... uh, Three fights from each of us. I'm sure there's a lot more. And I think if we all had a choice, we'd probably all pick Spence and Crawford. Um, 
but yeah, that's uh, the conclusion of the episode. Did you guys enjoy it? A lot of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. It was, uh, it's been a really, really good year for Luke Horner, or at least six months when we started this and onwards and upwards for the new year. Yeah, I think you summed it up nicely there, onwards and upwards. Um, but good news for you guys, it's not the, the end of our end of year content. We've got a Q&A coming out on uh, New Year's Eve. The deadline for questions is actually Boxing Day. So at the time of this going out is Christmas Eve. Um, so you've got two more days to get your questions in. We've got our email address in the description. You can send it there. Or if you follow us on any of our socials, links also in the description. You can DM us, tweet us, leave it in the comments section here if you don't mind people seeing it. Um, we'll give you a shout out on there as well. And the best question also wins a prize as well. So it's definitely worth getting involved. That'll be out on New Year's Eve. Um, but I just want to thank the listeners again for getting involved and hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Um, thanks for the team for getting involved as well. We'll be posting our official winners on social over the coming days. Um, and yeah, just keep sending in your questions for the Boxing Day thing and we'll join you in the new year for the, uh, the podcast with me and Charlie again. So thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you soon.